Since the dawn of the machine age, handcrafted and handmade goods have, well, they've fallen into somewhat of a decline. Convenience has replaced craftsmanship. But in a place like Natchez, Mississippi, there are certain people here that strive for the best of both worlds. As the oldest city on the banks of the Mississippi, Natchez holds a special place for talented artisans interested in preserving and restoring features from the past. So are you ready to dive in where the river runs wide and the history runs deep? We'll start our tour at one of the oldest buildings in Natchez, King's Tavern, which happens to belong to a great friend of mine, Regina Charbonneau. So let's go check her out. You know me, I always have to carry plants wherever I go. Well, I couldn't come empty handed. Well, you know you can come here empty handed <laughs> or with gifts anytime. You know, I love having you. Why don't we get these planted? Sounds like a plan. Well, be perfect in your little vegetable garden. I'm excited about this. Man, these beds are perfect. What do you have, 10 of them? I have 10 of them, 10 raised beds. You know, and you turn me on to raised beds. That mm. is the best thing in the world. It's easy. And it's great. You wouldn't believe what I can produce just out of these beds. Oh, like, yes, I would. <laughs> well, of course, I guess you would. If anybody would know, you would. But the lettuce, we we're able to provide fresh lettuce for the restaurant all year round. Well, I thought you'd enjoy this romaine, a little broccoli there, and I think even brought you some Brussels sprouts. Thank you. Yeah, we put some of this on some of those famous flatbreads you make. I love arugula <laughs> on a flatbread, and I've got a flatbread in the oven we need to get in. Oh, good. Well, we can come back to this later. Okay. We'll get them planted before I leave. It smells amazing. Oh, thank mm. you. You know, and it's so nice to be able to get the arugula from the garden and toss it in a little oil and put on top of any of the flatbread. Absolutely. So. Yeah, look at that. It's beautiful. Get a couple of forks for thank us here. Thank you. Mm -mm. We'll jump right in here. Yes. So Regina, what drew you to this wonderful tavern? My husband Doug and my son Jean Luc wanted to do the rum distillery. Doug found this property and he only wanted the old store on the corner. And I fell in love with this building and almost the curse of vision. <laughs> I could see exactly what needed to be here. I wasn't really so planning, good, thank you, opening another restaurant, but I just felt this just called for something that was empty. And I just thought to do the wood fired oven and kind of recreate a little bit of the old tavern atmosphere with the craft cocktail. Yeah, they would have cooked with an open fire. Absolutely. Right. And it would have been simple. Probably they had one entree. I wish I could get away with that every night. But, <laughs> yeah. but so I just kept it really simple. Mm. It's the flatbreads are the focused. We um, handcrafted. Handcrafted. And that's kind of, you know, what's going on. You want locally sourced. I, mm -hmm. You know, the raised beds provide this beautiful Couldn't be lettuce local and greens. No, <laughs> as local as it gets. And it just kind of fits into what people are looking for. And I've enjoyed it. I just fell in love with this building. When we were restoring this building, I started figuring out how to make it a house <laughs> because right. I loved it so yeah. much. But you kept it's envisioning a, yourself living here. Yeah, but it's a three-story tavern. It would be really hard yeah. to. It was built live as a in. tavern. It was. Yeah. And it dates back to 1789. It's the oldest building in Natchez. You know, the ground floor is where the horses used to be. This was really the tavern right here. Mm, this upper. On the third yeah, floor right. was uh, sleeping bunks. But it's just, again, it's just a fabulous yeah. building. I love the way this back porch looks out over that marvelous lawn. Thank yeah, you. it's wonderful. Yeah, I could be here all day. I'm glad yeah. you're with me. <laughs> I am too. It's so much fun. Later, we'll have to get out there and get to work and plant those vegetables. Okay, well, let's we'll eat. enjoy this now. Yeah, yeah. enjoy mm. this now. I'm putting you to work in a little mm. bit. In addition to the tavern, Regina and her husband Doug own Charbonneau Distillery, which is conveniently located just next door. It's where they make their handcrafted rum. Suddenly I'm feeling a little thirsty. Come on in. Mm. 
in 1990, before children, my wife and I went to the islands and had good rum for the first time and decided that that was an interesting product and we've tracked it and collected and enjoyed it over many, many years. Always joked about having a rum distillery someday. Didn't make any sense in the 90s. We returned the Natchez in 2000 and we're right in the middle of sugarcane country and all made sense. The process for making rum is that it's all based on sugar cane. There's two or three different ways you can use that sugar. You can either crush the cane and use free run juice, like you make wine from free run grape juice, or you can use molasses, which 90% of the rum in the world is made from molasses, which is the product left over at the end of the sugar extraction process at the sugar mill. Uh, we chose a little different route in that we use molasses from the mill, but we also use some of the raw sugar from the mill in a secret combination that allows us to get some flavor from the sugar itself as opposed to just from the end product, the molasses, which has a little more bitterness. So right now I'm adding roughly 50 pounds of molasses. It looks end up being a five gallon bucket's worth. It's, our molasses is super thick. It runs about uh, 16 pounds per gallon. So it's twice as heavy as water. We uh, used 120 degree water to dissolve our sugar. Sugar and molasses do mix well with water. And then we add 10 ounces of yeast. So we ferment for about 48 hours, is what it takes uh, at a 100 degree temperature. The yeast does what we want it to do, and at the end of that 48 hours, we've taken a 300 gallon vat of sugar water and converted it to a six or 7% alcohol solution. At that point, we have 20 to 21 to 25 gallons of alcohol somewhere in that 300 gallon tank, and then we have to find it. Once the liquid vaporizes and turns into steam, then the molecules will bounce off of the copper and they're extracting sulfur. Everyone has it, whether you're making whiskey, vodka, rum, you've got to get the sulfur out of the process and clean up the alcohol. So the copper does that for us. It's absolutely an accomplishment for someone who never took a chemistry class. I didn't know exactly what was going on. I can read about it, but I can't necessarily uh, know exactly what the, what the absolute backbone basis of it is. But we know how it works. Uh, when we did the first fermentation, we're wondering what it should and would taste like and look like, and we saw that, and we did the first distillation. We again found out what it looks like when it's happening, what it tastes like when it's coming off of the still, uh, and then eventually what it tastes like when it goes into the bottle. We're now finding out what it tastes like when it's been in a barrel for a few months. Both my son and I, we know what we want in our bottle, and I think we hit it every time. Boy, this looks really good, but I think it's time for a libation. Oh, Ricky, thank you. Wow, look at that. You think, awesome. This is so light and fresh. It's got a nice tart edge to it. I gotta have the recipe. Guys, and what I'm gonna be doing today is called the Hemingway Daiquiri. It was actually created for Ernest Hemingway in Havana, Cuba at the uh, Floridita Bar. Uh, the bartender found out that he was diabetic, so he came up with this alternative to a classic Cuban cocktail for him. Starts off with one and a half ounces of rum, quarter of an ounce of maraschino liqueur, three quarters of an ounce of fresh squeezed lime juice, and a half ounce of fresh grapefruit juice. Add ice to fill. And when you're shaking the cocktail, you're actually breaking off the corners of the ice cube, so you want to actually get in there and shake it. That imparts just a ton of oxygen into it. It makes it a little bit frothy. However, when you do it, you're breaking off the corners of the ice cubes. And if you leave those sitting, it'll actually dilute the cocktail. So I'd take a cone strainer and get rid of those. Garnish with a maraschino cherry. And there we have 
of the Hemingway Daiquiri. All right, we've got everything set up. Regina, it is so exciting to be back at Twin Oaks. Oh, you know I love having you here. And in your kitchen. That's the best Go place. Go figure. <laughs> right. Where do we always end up when you're here? Let's work on these fritters. Yeah, well, you know, I love this recipe because it was inspired on the same trip that Doug and I went on before we had children <laughs> that inspired the rum. And uh, when I was in the islands in Guadalupe, all the women, uh, all the chefs are women, and they're called cuisinaires. And oh. But I was, we ate. So you'd be a cuisinaire. I would be a cuisinaire, <laughs> and they wear madras skirts and headdresses. But the food was so light and mm. wonderful, very heavy French influence. But they do a fritter called acras, and it was so light. It's a smoked cod fritter. And of course, I had to give it my southern, add some twist. corn and sure. shrimp to yeah. it, yeah. little southern twist. But it was, um, I started asking the different restaurants when I went there how they made it. And I got the recipe for the cod fritters and then adapted it for my Wonderful. restaurant. So these will be as light as what you had in Guadalupe. Let's hope so. Okay. If, you, if you do your job right, I'm if you whip do those egg whites. I'll okay. do my best. Okay, all right. I'm good with eggs. Good. Well, we're going to start with a cup of flour. Okay three teaspoons of baking powder, and just mix your dry ingredients. So all the dry mm -hmm. ingredients together, yeah, okay. And then I've got some uh, Cajun spice, so I've got three teaspoons of that. So the Cajun spice, sometimes they tend to be a little salty, so you might add and test a little bit. But of course, you're adding a lot more ingredients. So then I add a teaspoon of fresh garlic, two cups of corn, and that's what makes these so good. You have four cups of the good so is that stuff. that about two ears? That's, you know, it's actually about four. About four ears, okay. Today. Fresh corn. Fresh corn. Right. And then I'm um, just gonna add, kind of put everything in here. And then I add the egg yolks. Two egg yolks. Two egg yolks. And just the green onions. Mm -hmm. It's uh, half a cup of green onions. Yeah. And so this is basically, it's a tablespoon of fresh basil that's been minced in oil. Yep, yeah, yep. Yeah. But fresh, you can put it straight in. Yep, and you can keep that in your freezer as yes, well. Yes, and I little... always keep that on hand. You're gonna think that this is very dry because the only moisture really are the egg yolks right now. Mm -hmm. But I start just stirring this around and after I get this, I wanna make sure this is mixed. And you wanna put all the ingredients in there first and then mix it together, not That's just step true. by step yeah. each time you add, don't That's mix That's right, it. the only thing that I mix together first Pour are the, the dry ingredients. The dry, dry ingredients, mm -hmm. then I put everything in. Mm -hmm. So now you're, I'm gonna give you two egg whites and okay. I'm gonna have you whip them. Okay. And the key is to have them um, stiff but not dry. Okay. Okay. Sure. Doesn't take long. So you want that moisture. Yes. That is perfect. Okay. See how you can you get the yeah. peak, mm -hmm. but you don't want them dry. Yeah, you can so, see it happening, so, all right? All right, so let's... Let me fold those in. That would be great. There we go. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's like mm -hmm. we're making a lemon meringue pie. <laughs> <laughs> then I'm gonna take the spatula and we're gonna just fold these in. Right. So do a turning motion. I kind of like cut the bowl, cut the ingredients in half. Mm -hmm. And then and fold And turn it. Mm -hmm. and fold. All right. I'm happy with that. What about you? Yeah, no, it looks good to okay. me. Okay. <laughs> You're so the boss. So now I'm going to take, have a little fryer here. About how many will this recipe make, Regina? Well, this size. This size, I probably could get about, yeah, I could get, and I'm just doing kind of half of it. I'm sure uh -huh. I could probably get 36 Making out sure of here. Making sure you get some shrimp in each one of them. Yes. Okay. And I'm sure I can get uh, about 36, three mm -hmm. dozen out of here. So you can cut this recipe in half. Mm -hmm. And, you know, with deep frying, you don't want to overcrowd because you're, the temperature will go down quickly. When deep frying, when it comes to the top, mm -hmm. 
it's usually ready. Yeah, I see you got several see, I've got candidates some, there. Yeah, just about there. Okay, Alan, I'm going to hand you the plate. All right, I'll make some room for you here. All right. And yeah, kind of let that last one cook. So beautiful golden color. Mm -hmm. You want to make sure you get that, let that excess oil get out. Mm -hmm. Boy, the smell divine. Yum. Mm. And I'm going to show you how pretty these are. Look at that. Look at that. Mm. Shrimp are cooked perfectly. Ooh, that is light. Mm -hmm. But listen, it doesn't need any salt. Mm -mm. Wonderful. Mm -hmm. Thank you for sharing this recipe. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's always a joy to be here. Mm -hmm. From pre-Civil War dream home, to ladies college, to now a beautifully restored National Historic Landmark, Stanton Hall has had an interesting and long history. Now renovating a historic home is no easy task. Just ask Bridget Green and Duncan Morgan, Natchez locals who share a passion for preserving the past. I'm Bridget Green. I am president of the Pilgrimage Garden Club, which owns Stanton Hall and Longwood. We are on the grounds of Stanton Hall right now, and both properties are national landmarks. There are 13 national landmark properties in Natchez. We also have over 1,200 houses or buildings that are on the historic national registry, which makes Natchez very unique. Most of our community is involved in restoration and preservation because there are so many of these beautiful buildings in our community. My philosophy has always been when we finish something to make it look like we've never been there, to try to replicate exactly like it was, you know, when it was, when it was built originally, including using the same mortar and the techniques. And much of what you see around Natchez, the homes, the gardens, the brick walks, and elaborate gardens and all were either added or they had to be taken up and restored. And also, it's been a busy life. Restoring these homes is totally a great amount of energy, but it's very rewarding, and it is something that gets in your blood. Uh, my husband and I have now restored four homes here in Natchez, and we're probably not at the, the end of our line either, but it's just, something that is, you give back to the community and restoring these homes is something that has to be done for history. It's home. I am old Natchez. I've never wanted to live anywhere else. I am very concerned about the preservation and of the city itself. And it's, Natchez is coming into the 20th century. And I say 20th deliberately. You know, so that's a good thing. And some of the ones who are, who come in now, fortunately we had an influx of people from California or Texas or some with money, with real money who came in and bought some of these houses and restored them and made them ready to stand for another hundred years. But to me, Natchez is home, and I can't judge by anywhere else because this has been home all my life. I've never wanted to, and I've never lived anywhere where I could compare. So I am old Natchez. Natchez is an old town. We're both unique, and I guess we're compatible. Large trees produce the wood from which beautiful furniture is made. Period appropriate pieces, particularly original ones, 
set the ambience for visitors to truly experience what life might have been like way back then. I went to a very unique private school in upstate New York where I learned the rudiments of upholstery when I was 13 and 14 years old. I worked in a cabinet shop. I wasn't running machinery, but I learned the basic joinery and some finish work. You know, a lot of the stuff in here is here to be refurbished, and most of it just needs little bits of work done. And, uh -huh. um, I have a little bit of professional love. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> and since since I have such a reverence for this stuff, I tend to know what to do with it. Mm -hmm. And um, and so I get, as you can see, with the volume of stuff that's in here and in the rest of the complex, you know, I, I have a lot of stuff coming my way. And you know, until the stuff comes into the workshop to be done, I just sort of set it up. And occasionally, I have people that come through that want to buy things, and I confer with the owners and can make a deal. Sometimes, sure, sometimes sure. not. Don't you um, find that with this? quality of furniture that you have to really fully understand the craftsmanship that went into it to be a craftsman who can then come in and restore it and repair it. Yeah, if you're, you know, to, first of all, you got to be wired for it. You need to be a perfectionist. And it helps to have a background where you've been exposed to very sophisticated woodworkers, curators, architects, interior designers. Mm -hmm. And with those sorts of exposures, you end up with an amalgam of, of instincts about what to do with things and what not to do with them. I think what it is, is when you have a project, you understand what your goal and what you want to accomplish with the project. And then you use your experience and your energy to work and arrive at the end result that you want. And it's all about keeping a vision of the end result and, a, and adjusting and adapting your methodology to get to that. And it's, um, it's sort of a challenge, it's a great, great depth of satisfaction in it you know I have friends that are CPAs who go boy I sure would like to do what you do you know I get it done at the end of the day and all I have to look forward to is closing my eyes and seeing rows of numbers going on the inside of my eyelids where I get to look at something that beautiful functional piece of furniture whether you sit on it or look at it or put things in it or put things on it so you get that gratification and that that rocks me along pretty good I hope you've enjoyed our little peek into this beautiful historic city that's called Natchez, Mississippi. I don't know about you, but I applaud their efforts in celebrating handcrafted and local. Hey, I think I can hear Regina's fritters calling my name. Mm-mm. Well, until next time, I'm Alan Smith. have fallen in somewhat of a decline. But, yeah. 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 A lot of, oh, it kind of comes right up. Cajun spice will get you Cajun every time. Cajun spice. A lot of <coughs> these tend to be salty. Mm -hmm. <coughs> so. You pick it up with Cajun spice. <coughs> yeah. This fritter recipe is a killer. <laughs> this is a killer. Uh -huh.